It's not far from being a full year since I started installing my self-hosted smart home kit. So I thought that I would give you a bit of an update on what's changed, what has been working, and what really hasn't. Being self-hosted, that means that none of my data left my house. No one at Google or Amazon or Apple knows what I'm up to at home, and I don't need to worry about some parent company deciding that all of my devices I paid my own money for should just not work anymore. Now, as a quick refresher, I'll give you a quick rundown of what I'm using. The whole thing revolves around an amazing open source project called Home Assistant. I'm using a Zigbee dongle to connect all of my devices, meaning they can't connect to the internet directly and, you know, be part of a, a botnet somewhere. I've also got some Philips Hue color changing bulbs, some little Sonoff temperature and humidity sensors, an uh, Aquara uh, motion and sort of light sensor. It's a tiny little thing quite cool. Uh, we also have some uh, smart sort of, uh, Mose scene changer uh, light switch type things and a Mose Zigbee thermostat. Since the last video, I've also added my solar project, also DIY of course, which itself has a few extra sensors to track how much energy I'm generating and how much I'm using. I've also started using the InfluxDB add-on in Home Assistant, which means that it now stores all of my usage data from all of the various sensors that I've got. So if I want to look back and see, I don't know, say how often the heating was actually running last Tuesday, well, I can now just go and look that up. I can also use Grafana, or the Grafana add-on, to query that data for even more control. You can do sums, averages, and a lot more, which has been really useful, especially for the solar power generation and how that compares to my consumption of that energy. I've also added a new flow in Node Red, which calculates how much money I've saved based on the energy usage that I've monitored, which is also pretty nice. So that's what I've got, but what's it been like? Well, on the whole, it's been pretty great. The biggest success by far is my smart heating control. Especially now we're back into winter, having it intelligently control when to turn on the, the boiler has meant that I've saved money on the gas bill and kept the house at a much more constant and consistent temperature. No more waking up freezing or boiling or having to get up and turn the boiler off because I'm being cooked alive. It's not perfect, but it is much much better. The other thing that I've enjoyed the most is the adaptive lighting control, as in the Philips Hue bulbs change their brightness and color temperature throughout the day. They're brighter and cooler and a cooler color temperature in the morning and get progressively warmer in color temperature and slightly dimmer at night. This is especially helpful in our bedroom, where when it's bedtime, we can basically just have the light at 10% brightness and incredibly warm, which helps not blind you and wake you up and you're you know, trying to get, to get ready to sleep. I also enjoyed being able to remotely control things like the lights, including from my phone, even when I'm not in the house, thanks to the WireGuard VPN. That has been really helpful. Say, when we're away, I can turn the heating way down and disable the, the smart heating control. Then, when we're on our way back, well, I can turn it back on and turn it back up so that we don't waste money heating the house when we're not there, but we can return to a nice warm home. But what about some of the things that haven't worked as well? Well, in short, these Mose scene changer switches suck. In theory, they are great, um, and for short periods they can work fine, but basically these are blank switches that uh, don't have any actual switch paraphernalia on the back, they're just uh, buttons to control things you know, over the Zigbee network. And you can map the different actions to different things in Home Assistant. In my case, I generally just use them as light switches, but my god, do they drive me insane. Day to day, the most common frustration with these is that it takes two presses to do anything, you know, if you haven't used them in a little while, because the first one 
wakes the switch up, and then the second one is the one that actually completes the action you wanted. But of course, you can't click the switches you know, too quickly together, otherwise it'll register as a double press and not do the action that you wanted. That gets pretty annoying for sure, and with how often it happens throughout the day, and as many times in a day, uh, and for using them for so long, it definitely gets on my nerves. But the bigger problem is, um, well, well, it's all of these. Uh, these are the batteries that just two of these Mose uh, scene changer switches have used in the last about nine months since I've actually had these ones. Um, they use the batteries every about two to three months. Uh, these are not CR2032s that you can buy you know, locally. These are CR2430s that you can only buy in packs on eBay. Oh, and even better is when they do start running out, instead of like continuing to work, um, what they do is they flash the LEDs at the bottom of the buttons constantly, which is really great when it happens at night and the, the switch is, you know, pointing at your face while you're sleeping. But also the great thing is that, um, yeah, they just don't work anymore. If the light is on and you press the button, if those lights are flashing, your light doesn't turn off. You have to go to your phone and do it or grab home assistant, whatever. Uh, and that's really annoying. And even worse, you actually can't change the batteries very easily because they are wedged in so tight that you basically need a screwdriver or a key or something to jam the battery out of its slots to then replace it. There is also no space back here to use anything else. You can't use rechargeable versions of these because they don't make them. They make a slightly larger size, but you couldn't fit that larger size in here. And so yeah, I'm just I'm just really annoyed at these. <laughs> the other device that's not quite as good as I'd want it to be is this motion sensor. It is great when it works. It tracks the light level throughout the day and will only turn on the Philips Hue bulb if the light level in the room is below 10 lux and it detects motion for more than a second, which is great. The problem is, it just randomly decides to drop off the network. And I'm not entirely sure which of the like 10 different actions I do that I always try to get it back onto network actually gets it back on the network. I take the battery out, I hold the pairing button down, restart Home Assistant, try forcing a reconnect in Home Assistant. I mean, one of those normally works, but it really shouldn't be dropping off the network anyway. So what's next for my DIY smart home? Well, we're thinking about moving in the not too distant future, so probably nothing for now. But in the next, the, the sort of next step would likely be with uh, smart thermostatic radiator valves or smart TRVs. They control how much hot water from the central heating system flows into that radiator, which means that, let's say, if I'm gaming in my, my office, making the room plenty hot, the valve on my office radiator can close, but I can still have the smart heating system turn on the heating to warm up the living room because that's getting too cold without boiling me alive in an already hot room. That would help balance out the heating system, especially when there are external factors like, you know, different PCs generating heat for me. And it would also mean that we could turn off the heating in the rest of the house at night and just keep our bedroom warm and vice versa during the day, further saving money, not heating rooms we aren't using. I'd also like to get some door sensors for even better smart control too. Although actually even better than that, would be using as few battery powered devices as possible. You can get wall powered motion sensors and switches. So I would prefer fitting some of those instead they're a lot less likely to drop off the network randomly, or rather obviously, need new batteries every three months. Because of the way Zigbee devices work, if it's a, a wall-powered or mains-powered device, it can act like a, a router or a, a stepping, a hopping point, whereas battery-powered devices can only act as endpoints. Power devices basically strengthen the, the network and add more nodes, whereas battery-powered devices are more like parasites to the system. With that said though, the battery powered temperature and humidity sensors I have from Sonoff haven't skipped a beat. They've been fantastic, so it's not all that bad. If you were to ask me if I still recommend self-hosting your smart home kids, I think the answer is still very much yes. The benefit of having actual privacy while still having all of the latest and coolest tech and features 
is definitely a nice one. The difficulties in setting it up uh, definitely aren't the you know as easy as setting up something like a Google Home or a you know uh, Amazon Echo or whatever and the the various smart home things that just use apps and whatever. But it's also kind of a little bit easier as well because it's all controlled via one system. So if I want things to interact with each other, if I want my, you know, uh, so a single button I can press where if I'm leaving the house, it will turn the smart heating down, it will turn all the lights off, it will, you know, do whatever else. I can do that with Home Assistant. Whereas if you do have a fragmented network, maybe if they all support the given smart voice assistant that you may use, then maybe you could do that. But again, then you're talking about the sort of privacy concerns and also the fact that None of this will stop working besides obviously batteries running out, but there's no kind of corporate overlord who can just turn off all of my stuff and make it all stop working. Whereas for a lot of the different smart home things, as we keep seeing, well, they certainly can. It definitely has uh, some drawbacks in, you know, the, the troubleshooting steps that you might need to do and things like incompatibilities. It's kind of a, a common issue. And it definitely does take a bit more of a, a skilled hand at setting it all up. But especially if you do have a bit of time, a bit of knowledge, a bit of kind of enthusiasm to do it, I think that it's definitely still worth it. And well, it's also kind of fairly cheap to do as well. So that's not bad. With that said, those are kind of my thoughts and obviously my experiences with using smart home tech. If you are self-hosting your own smart home solutions, feel free to let me know what it's been like for you in the comments down below. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave those down there too. I'll leave some links to some of the better stuff that I'm using in the description if you want to check those out. If you want to see more videos like this one from me, hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. Check out the rest of the smart home series or the solar series if you haven't seen them already. And uh, yeah, that's kind of it. If you want to support the channel, keep me making these videos, you can check out uh, the YouTube join button and become a Patreon, pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one, or check out the other affiliate links and stuff. They're in the description down below. Everything helps and I very much appreciate when people like to support me. So thank you very much. Otherwise, that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you in the next video.